for me, quality means expressing some sort of truth in your life or your work. So instead of thinking, oh, I want to get the Mercedes by a certain age or own my house by this point or I want to achieve this at work, in the longer term, try to think more in terms of what sort of quality do I want to produce in a service or a product, some sort of quality that will express some sort of timeless truth in what it does or what it can do for people. What is and what is not true? Those who know themselves being better every single day. Hey, welcome back to the Think Grow podcast, where personal development meets real life. This is your host, Ruben Chavez, and today I'm speaking with Tom Butler Bowden. I've been wanting to speak with Tom for a while. He is the author of one of my favorite series of books of all time, frankly, that is the 50 Classics series. If you haven't heard of the 50 Classics series, I highly recommend you order all of them immediately. (laughs) It's a series of books that he started back in 2001, and it surveys different genres, different fields of study, and picks the 50 most influential works of each of those fields, the classics, in other words, and distills the essence of each of those works into a very condensed and readable four to five pages, something like that. And these are by far the best summaries of books that I've ever encountered. And actually, I shouldn't say summaries. In fact, they're not summaries. We talk about this in the conversation a bit, but they're distillations. A summary is more like an overview of kind of the main points. But a distillation of a book is more like the book itself just distilled to the essence and you get a much more intimate look and a much more accurate look and comprehensive look at what it is that the author was trying to say and the most important ideas of that work. So it's a phenomenal series. I highly recommend checking it out. It covers eight different genres and it starts with the self-help classics That was the first book back in 2001. And then he moved on to the success classics. And the third book is the spiritual classics. Then you have 50 psychology classics, 50 philosophy classics, 50 economics classics. And then more recently, he's done politics and business. So I've gotten a ton of value from this series. It's helped me in writing my book. And it's been massively influential, in fact, in shaping the ideas that have been foundational for the book that I'm writing. So anyway, I asked Tom about the process that went into writing these books and his whole reading schedule and how that fits into his life because he actually read the books. This wasn't a situation where you just looked at the Wikipedia article of a book and, and resummarized it. He, this man read the the works and he studied the the great thinkers and teachers of of our time and of times past and you know he, it's just very interesting to talk with someone who cares so much about knowledge and wisdom and bringing that to humanity so please check the show notes for some more resources because Tom has a lot of free content on his website and he's also working on a project called Memoed which is a note-taking community of sorts. So you can find all of the show notes at thinkgrowprosper.org under the podcast tab. Okay, so here we go. This is Tom Butler Bowden. Tom, it's great to have you on. And I I wanted to, just for people who are not familiar with, with who you are, uh, just give a little background for you know, where you came from and how you came to write these series of, of classic books that you, you have, these uh, summaries of classic books that you have. Yes. Well, I never intended to become a writer or create a series of books. 
you know, everything just happens with the first one. So in my case, I had a pretty good career in Australia, sort of political policy advice, etc. But I wanted to be more successful, you know, as most people do in their career. So I started reading self-help books, motivational books, and, you know, taking notes of them as well. But uh, at that point, I wasn't really thinking, oh, you know, I'm going to change career or anything. But over time, I got a little bit more uh, obsessed with these books and with, with the whole genre. And so I started to think, mm, I couldn't really imagine doing my career in, say, 20 years' time. So I started to think, you know, maybe this is a possible career for me. I didn't really think, you know, how it would come about. I just had this idea come into my mind, enable people to make intellectual and spiritual leaps forward. But I didn't really know how I would do that. And then I started, the two things sort of started to come together and I thought, oh, maybe I can write about all these classic books in self-help and motivation, turn my notes into a book. And then that led to, to the first book, 50 Self-Help Classics. Yeah, and, and, and since then you've written multiple books. And that was in 2001, I believe, right? Yeah. And, and then since then you've, had, you've written uh, uh, also the same type of book on success literature, on spirituality, psychology, philosophy, politics, and more recently, economics. That's amazing. I wanted to ask you a little bit about your, your career that you mentioned that you had transitioned from. You were a government advisor. Is that right? That's right. Yeah. So I was writing sort of briefing papers for, uh, for ministers in the government. I mean, it was very interesting work, you know, access to sort of secret information and stuff. But what it really gave me is this ability to absorb a lot of information and put it in a one page briefing. Yeah. So my bosses were like, write in a way that someone reading a tabloid newspaper could understand the issue <sighs> and to help someone make a decision on it. So unbeknownst to me at the time, I wasn't thinking about being a writer. I just thought, okay, I want to get better at this. So that did give me this, this skill in uh, putting together a lot of information, summarizing it and putting it in a way that that people would understand. And this skill just proved to be very useful uh, for me. Yeah, that, that seems like a, a very good job, good position to be in, to be able to develop that skill and then transition into your, into your career as a writer. Although I know you didn't plan it out like that. It seems like that, that the stars kind of aligned for that mm. in some respect, because something that struck me most about when I first opened the first book, I think I opened a psychology book, the psychology classics. That was my first book mm. of yours that I read. And something that struck me was that how succinct and how perfectly summarized these entries were because I've subscribed to different kind of um, apps, you know, Blinkist and, and different kind of programs and services that will summarize books for you. And the way I gauge their accuracy and their kind of effectiveness is by going to the books that I've read already and that I've internalized and that I know, and then seeing if it matches up with, with my conception of it. And usually they're just very watered down and they're very, superficial, I would say, and they don't capture the essence of the book, but your summaries do like yeah. they're, they're more than summaries. They're, they're just, they're a distillation. Yeah. I guess they're distillations of the, the, the main ideas in these influential works. And so anyway, you obviously, I just wanted to commend you on that, I, I suppose. Well, yeah, I just wanted to say you put your finger on it because a summary is different to a distillation or an essence. So, you know, AI is getting so good now that you're reading online sports summaries, business summaries. Mm. Blinkist, they employ like anonymous people to write the book summaries. But something very different is trying to get the essence, you know, of a book. So that means that you might not necessarily cover every point or every theme. Mm -hmm. but what I tried to do is give a sense of what the author really intended with this book and focus on that thing. So uh, for me, the, there's a point when I'm writing one of these chapters about a classic book, say, in psychology, and everything clicks. I can't really tell when that moment comes, but I just feel like, you know, maybe when an artist knows when they've finished painting a painting, when's the time to stop? I just think, okay, yeah, I've, I feel like I've captured the essence of the book now, uh, so I'm done. Yeah. 
So I, I want to get into your process and kind of how you you went about doing that, because I, I think what is different between, and you kind of alluded to this, what's different between you and other services and programs and, and, and people who have, who have offered summaries is that you actually like got deep into the work. You got deep into the original works. And from that, you produce the essence of it as opposed to just like a mechanical kind of AI type thing. And so, but anyway, I want to get into that. But first, I wanted to ask you one question. What did you, because you said that you started reading self-help and motivational literature. I think you, I think you mentioned in your other book, in your original book, the uh, Never Too Late to, to Be Great book, I think you mentioned that that was at 26 hmm. that you read your first kind of self-help book, like proper self-help book. What led you to do that? Because you were in this government job, you were in this government advisory position. What sparked that interest at, at, at that age and at that time period in your life to read self-help books? Yeah, well, I mean, as I mentioned, the sort of superficial reason is that I wanted to be more successful. So I read Anthony Robbins, I read Stephen Covey, I read The Magic of Thinking Big. And all of these books, you know, I felt at the time were helping me in some way. Yeah. But when I think about it now more deeply, I realised that, I mean, a very happy family life, et cetera, stable, good parents, et cetera. I realised, like, my dad never really gave me sort of obvious life lessons, you know, like sit me down by the lake and say, you know, you know, this is what life is about, son. You should do that, shouldn't do that. It was just sort of a moral code in the background. So in some ways I felt like I was a blank slate in terms of getting my guidance in life. So I think now that's why I was very attracted to the self-help books, that they provided all of this stuff in, you know, often very structured way and with a sort of success element to it. So I wonder now with a lot of people that that do read self-help books that perhaps something similar was going on. They were, you know, filling filling a vacuum that wasn't necessarily provided for them in their, in their upbringing. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I, I relate to you on a lot of levels. Your, your background, you described stable with parents and, and wanting to just be more successful and wanting to figure out what exactly that means. I, I relate to a lot of that. I also wanted to comment on the idea that I, I know you make a distinction between kind of personal development and, and self-help. I think personal development is probably the more broader picture of what you've been doing is just kind of how do we develop ourselves as humans? And that involves psychology and spirituality and all this. But there is seems to be a, a, a nice relationship between personal development and politics, which is the field you kind of came out of. You know, it's like personal development is how you figure out how to conduct yourself on a personal level. And then politics is something like trying to figure out how to conduct ourselves on a collective level. And so I, I think that you, uh, there was some, the seeds of greatness there in your, in your history. Well, I think that's, that's a very interesting point because I think of the, the guy, Samuel Smiles, who, who wrote the original book, 1859, called Self-Help. Yeah. And he was like a political journalist. And over time, I guess similar to me, he started giving like, talks to to working men's groups etc on success and that sort of thing and he realized at some some point that what was more important to him was that the real revolutions were happening inside people's heads so he made this shift from trying to sort of change the world to helping other people to have these sort of personal revolutions and for him and I agree with it this, this is long term this is more important than sort of attaching yourself to some political cause. Yeah. Yeah. I agree with that. Okay. So I, I wanted to just kind of get into a little bit. What, what was the process like writing these books? You started with the self-help book and, and you, you were making notes for yourself and, and summarizing these ideas for yourself. And then you realize, Oh, I should put this into a book. What was that process like? Was it just a natural outgrowth of your interest, your, your interest in reading these self-help books, and then you kind of just transferred it to a book, or was it a more structured experience? Well, I'm sort of person that I couldn't just read a book and without a pen in my hand and underlining stuff. And I guess I really wanted to not lose anything amazing that I was coming across. So my first thing was just, you know, underlining, taking notes of everything. And then I started to think, this would be even more useful if I 
made my own notes for every book that I did. So it sort of went from there. And now it's very clear in my mind that just reading a book and taking notes on it and then writing it up are two completely different things. You know, it, it's certainly about retention. You, you retain more, but you also start to create a, a map of knowledge in your head. So some people say to me, okay, you've read hundreds and hundreds of books. You've written about them as well. You know, how do you sort of make sense of all of that? I mean, there's no way to really begin to make sense of it unless you start to create some sort of map like that. Otherwise, it just goes in one ear and out the other. So I would just recommend to everyone, have, have a sort of structured approach to your reading, even if it's fiction, because it's very different to sort of create your own take and, and write it down on something than just sort of reading for pleasure. Definitely. You mentioned there are huge, there's a huge difference between just reading something and then taking the notes on it. And, and, and I agree with that because you, you do have to employ the skill of recall when you're trying to take notes and that's kind of, you're practicing remembering something and then you're ingraining that into your, your own neural pathways. And so I, I found that very useful. We kind of think in similar ways, I think, because I really like the idea of, of just taking in a lot of information and mapping the whole territory of kind of human values is, is how I conceptualize it. And your work has helped me do that. I'm actually working on a book myself that that is kind of developing a framework for kind of understanding all of this normative advice, this life advice that we receive, because it does start to, when you start to, to read broadly and you start to see the bigger picture, which, which can be done by reading one of your books, you start to realize that there are patterns. There are patterns. And a lot of individuals, a lot of authors, a lot of thinkers are saying similar things or even the same thing in just different ways. And they're using different language. And so that's, that's actually heartening because then you start to realize maybe there's not a million pieces of information out there. Maybe there's uh, or, or a million ways to live or a million pieces of life advice. Maybe there's less and maybe they're just, they're in categories, you know? And so your, your, your books, your works have helped me to see these kind of categories take shape. And so thank you for that. It's helped me in my own writing. That's good. Um, thank you. I think you, that that's really important what you say, because, um, you know, when I'm sort of reading all these books, taking notes and so on, sometimes there's a sort of, some things do contradict each other, right? Particularly if I'm doing a book on, say, philosophy or, or psychology. On the other hand, I did this book, 50 Prosperity Classics, which has covered a lot of sort of business books, um, law of attraction, etc. And to me, it was very clear what was coming out of that, very similar things. So, in the back of the book, I had this section, Prosperity Principles, and um, that was just really a sort of condensed, distilled take on what I'd got out of all these books. Most of the time I leave it up to the reader to sort of make their own um, judgments about how books and ideas fit together, but that was a case where it was just so clear to me that through history, through time, through authors in different countries writing about different things, there were so many similarities that, uh, that leapt out to me. Yeah, well, ultimately, you know, we're all the same species is how I think of it. And it's like, we all have certain needs. We all have the same brain, essentially. And, and so we're going to, over time, probably come up with the same ideas, like a variety of ideas for sure. But we're going to, it seems, come up with, with similar patterns of ideas. And so anyway, I, I, I agree with, with you on that. On that. The other thing I was going to, going to ask you was if you, and you kind of alluded to this, but do you feel, because <laughs> you might think that reading hundreds of books, literally just hundreds, hundreds of books would confuse you more than help you. Some people might have that perspective, but do you feel more competent after all of your studies and after all of the books you've written and all the summaries you've written, or do you feel more confused in some sense? <laughs> Yeah, look, at the time, some of these books that I that I was reading and researching, often in quite short time frames, like a year to do each book, I remember researching the spiritual classics book. Mm -hmm. As you can imagine, like that was a wild ride. Yeah. Covering everything from the Bible to Krishnamurti to Buddhism to like Jonathan Livingston Seagull, Conversations with God. I mean, all these amazing books in their own right. 
but sort of taking them in over over a several months or a year and trying to make sense of it. So I felt like I was just sort of a spiritual guinea pig, and I wouldn't recommend that to to other people. I felt sort of burnt out by the end of it. Mm. But the more sort of functional disciplines, say like psychology, philosophy. I mean, back before I started becoming a writer, I had this idea that every person on the planet should really know a lot more than they do, you know, that they should have access to more information, more knowledge. And so when I came to write like psychology classics, philosophy classics, again, I was a sort of uh, guinea pig for that. But I wanted to cover all the key ideas, the key philosophers, psychologists, and put it all in one place so that it'd be a great entry point for people, even if they didn't dig, you know, deeper into any of these ideas, that they'd at least be aware of some of the the key thinking, the key books, the key people in these fields. You know, I thought that that has to be useful on some level. Oh, definitely. Oh, definitely. Because most people aren't going to read the source material. You know, most people aren't going to read a whole, the, the whole Plato's Republic. You know, that's just not going to happen. Or they're not going to sit down and read Sigmund Freud's interpretation of dreams. Not everyone's interested in that. But I think that what the value of these works are and the value of, of, of your works in turn is that they offer a handful of really influential ideas and to know what those ideas are just as, you know, concepts is a really useful thing. Like, you know, just one thing, just one thing from one book. If you can carry that in your mind, then you know essentially what that is and you do a great job of articulating that. Yeah. Well, every chapter I do on a book, as you know, I even boil that down to a one line summary. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I love that. Which is called in a nutshell. And often I only sort of remember that nutshell. Other people find that very useful as well, that you can boil down Plato to a sentence or two. But, you know, I, the whole idea is that I do the work for people. So I think you alluded to it at the beginning, like, you know, why books? It's because I, I love books themselves and I want to give respect to the author. There are many ways now that you can learn about something. You know, there's Wikipedia, there's podcasts, there's documentaries, etc. But for me, nothing really replaces the experience of reading a book from beginning to end that someone has thought about often for years, even decades, sort of poured their life into it. So that's my sort of path to providing the essence to a book is that I really respect the author. And people say to me, well, you must be a speed reader to get through these books. In fact, it's almost the opposite. The introduction and the first chapter of any book I read, I give it a lot of time and attention. You know, I sort of immerse myself in the idea. And later in the book, you know, I can sort of speed up. But the, the point you make is that a lot of people don't have the time or inclination to read whole books now. So I see myself as a sort of miner that goes deep underground to really go back to these original sources and give them respect and sort of come up to the surface with the with the key themes. How long does it take you to read a book that you're doing a summary on? Often I'll have several books on the go. I'm, I'm reading them all at once. So in that respect, I'm not reading fast. But when i am got tight deadlines, I'll probably give a week to each book that I'm having to write about. So um, that sort of seems like a short amount of time. Yeah. It obviously depends on the book. Like if it's a sort of modern bestseller, if I'm working on it every day, nine to five, it's a lot of time to actually take really good notes and then write it up. But other books, you know, some of the philosophy ones I've done, you know, Sartre, Heidegger, etc. <laughs> you can't just read those books <laughs> in a few days. You have to think about it mull over them, start writing some notes, think about it in terms of other books, think about it in terms of the whole genre. So there's, there's no sort of shortcuts, really. Do you have any help, like research assistance or anything like that in, in writing your, your, summer, your books? I have tried it in the past. When I've been up against tough deadlines, I thought, I really need some help to do this. But it's never really worked because... Um, on the surface, my books are just objective reference guides, right? 
to the key books in a subject. But actually they're not like that. It's always going to be one person, my personal take on a book, but I think of a, a judgment on the, on the important ideas or where the author was coming from. So in that respect, someone else I can't just sort of contract it out to. You know, it has to be me. So in that respect, all my books, although they seem sort of, you know, it's like a, it's like an objective guide to economics, it, they're always going to be, in the end, idiosyncratic. And if you look at my Amazon reviews, some people say, oh, I got this guy's so left-wing. Some people say this guy's so right-wing. You know, it's in the eye of the beholder. <laughs> I try to be objective, but obviously you can't be. Well, man, I, I disagree. I, I think that your books, I can't tell your bias because you, you are very even-handed. I think that you're, you're very fair with, with all of your, your summaries. I really do. Like, there's not an obvious bias. Like, I'm very, I'm very sensitive to that, partly because I've studied values a lot and the psychology of politics and personality psychology. So I understand, like, people's, I understand what behavior is tied to what kind of traits and temperament and political leanings and things like that. And you're, you give a very even-handed account to even the most contentious writers like Marx. And, um, and, and, and so anyway, it's just, I, I commend you on that again. I, I really, I disagree with those Amazon reviewers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, it looks, it's a personal thing. You know, I was probably always, you know, in, in school, I was always the person who's like the peacemaker trying to sort of bridge different ideas and bring people together. So that's me. You know, you you mentioned like humanity before. We're all human beings, and and you obviously your personal interest at the moment, you know, is like uh, conflicting values and ideas and so on. And I find that fascinating too because I guess the opposite of objective looking at books and ideas is ideology, right? Because an ideology at the end of the day is sort of intellectual laziness mm -hmm. and ideology is like where someone has done a bit of research or thinking maybe and then just sits down and thinks okay that's enough I'm done I know what I believe I'm not going any further I'm not really going to test my ideas or opinions and so on but the problem with that is that ideologies they start to divorce from reality so you know there was the for instance the ideology of communism which after the first decade or two started to divorce from the reality on the ground, actually what was happening to people, how things were run, how prosperous people were getting. So that's you know, probably the most famous example of an ideology. But it happens to all of us, you know, in personal life, in our personal beliefs and so on. So un unless you keep questioning yourself, being open to new ideas, you will sort of get stuck in an intellectual rut and, uh, you know, it ultimately won't lead you to the places you want to get to. Definitely. Yeah. I, I The way I kind of conceptualize that ideolo ideology in particular, I think, is very similar to what you're saying. But it's like trying to explain the world or view the world through a very narrow set of values, basically. And the reality is that humans evolutionarily have had to deal with such a wide variety of social environments and physical environments that we've had to develop an array of strategies to deal with these. And so some of these strategies are really useful. Like it's really useful to adopt the strategy of let's, I call it the autonomy ethic. It's like you can be an individual and express yourself and be self-determining and you're your own person, right? Like that's a good strategy. But if you don't have your full arsenal of strategies that we've developed over time, if you're not aware of those, and if you don't employ those, then you're going to be fragile and you're going to view everything through one lens. For example, in this example, the opposite to the autonomy ethic would be the connection ethic, which is that, yes, we're individuals, but we're also members of a group and we also need to be accepted. And, and that carries a whole different value structure with it, like community and, and sacrifice for the group and, and even conformity. And so People want to explain the world through one narrow set of values and stake their claim on that and say, this is just how it is. But then when the environment shifts or when the 
the situation changes, then they're not prepared to employ a different strategy and a different set of values, so to speak. And so it's just, it's so useful. That's why I find your work so valuable is because we need, I think the, the way that the world is going and how complex it is, we need to be able to map the whole mosaic of values that, that we're dealing with. Like what kind of creatures are we in reality so that we can kind of evolve ourselves into the kind of creatures that we ought to be? The two kind of sides of the same coin. Yeah, and actually I think that is my main criticism of the whole personal development literature, which I sort of arrived at over many years, is that it's very much about the ethic of individualism and just sort of myself against the world and getting, you know, up by your bootstraps, which is very powerful ethic. And, you know, it's Nietzsche is probably the sort of philosopher that represents that idea the most. And, you know, look where he sort of ended up (laughs) intellectually, like a mess. So, yeah, I agree. There's maturity means realising that you are part of a larger system and society and that you you don't get anywhere without sort of appreciating yourself as something larger. And, you know, in, in his book Outliers, Malcolm Gladwell talked about that a lot. You know, it was the genuine theory of success he had. He wanted to go against the sort of self-made ethos and say, no, it very much depends on your upbringing, where you came from, your generation, which country you're born into, all of that. So I sort of agreed with him. I think he went a little bit too far because in doing that, he slightly denigrated the role of the self and the individual, et cetera. So in my book, Never Too Late to Be Great, I had the example of Ray Kroc, which I thought his, you know, the founder of McDonald's, that his rise couldn't really be explained by his environment or his background, his upbringing. You know, it's always there's some sort of spark of ambition or something inside people that comes out, sort of rises above whatever their sort of circumstances are. So you have to accommodate both things, but I think you're totally right. We need to have a more sort of mature awareness of all the elements in success and personal development here. Hey there, I wanted to take a quick moment to tell you about one of our sponsors for this show, Skillshare. I love learning new skills and keeping my mind sharp. Skillshare is by far one of my favorite ways to do this. It's an online learning community with thousands of different classes for creative and curious people. You can take classes on writing, photography, cooking, productivity, social media marketing, and much more. As many of you know, I've been working on a book. And a while back, I took a couple writing classes. One of them was called Creative Writing, Crafting Personal Essays with Impact. That one was by essayist Roxane Gay. And the other one was called The Writer's Toolkit, Six Steps to a Successful Writing Habit. And that one was by Simon Van Bowie, who's an author. And I was just blown away by the depth and clarity and practicality of these classes. Both really helped me to hone my skills and improve my craft. Skillshare is all video-based and it's all self-paced, which I love. And most classes are under an hour with short lessons to fit any schedule. I'm talking like 10 minutes per lesson in most cases, which is a very digestible way to break up any new subject. And it's less than 10 bucks a month with an annual subscription. So explore your creativity at Skillshare.com slash thinkgrow. And if you visit that link, you'll get a free trial of their premium membership. That's Skillshare.com slash thinkgrow. I heard you on a couple different podcasts talk about your idea of success, something that I've tried to do over the years. And I think I have a fairly, I think I've clarified my thinking on this a a bit, but I'd like to hear your, your take on it. What's your idea of success and what what does the notion of success actually mean? Because it it does become abstract at some point and it becomes a little bit muddy even, especially in, in modern, in the modern era. People have a lot of conflicting notions of success, but what do you think the idea of success should mean to people? Yeah, I I have thought about this and um, having read all these hundreds of success, self-help books, for me, success 
is means truth, right? By that I mean that to be successful or something to be successful, it has to reveal some sort of truth. And truth is something that exists outside of time. So what I mean by that is that someone can appear very successful, you know, in their own lifetimes. You know, Hitler was successful for like 10 years in his rise to power, etc. But of course, time revealed all to be an illusion. Other people can seem like a failure, but only later in their life or even when they're dead, they can seem successful because their ideas or their work or their output embodied some kind of truth. So when thinking about success, you have to think, what am I creating or trying to create that is genuinely quality? I think that's a good word to think about. It's this book, Zen and the Art Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, talks about this idea of quality. I start to wonder, what the hell is quality? And for me, quality means expressing some sort of truth in your life or your work. So instead of thinking, oh, I want to get the Mercedes by a certain age or own my house by this point or I want to achieve this at work, in the longer term, try to think more in terms of what sort of quality do I want to produce in a service or a product, some sort of quality that will express some sort of timeless truth in what it does or what it can do for people. So for me, that's, that's a better way of thinking about success than how we conventionally see it. I love that. And there's a quote in your book, Think Long, that I really love. And it kind of captures one of your big ideas in the book, which is the simple act of thinking in terms of years and decades will mean that quality is invested in whatever it is we are offering the world. And you said you wrote the book, Think Long, because you wanted to pay more mind to this element of time that was missing from the self-help literature. And I think that that sentence captures it so so well. Just that very shift of thinking in terms of longer periods of time will dramatically shift your behavior. And without being able to articulate it in recent years, that's what I've done for myself too, is, is, is totally shift my thinking into, into a much, into much broader time scales. Yeah. I mean, you know, there's this famous saying, some people attribute it to Bill Gates. I'm not sure he did actually say it, that people overestimate what they can achieve in a year and underestimate they can achieve in a decade. And I'd even go beyond that and say decades, because, you know, you miss out the factor of compounding. So some things are incredibly hard to achieve in the short term and you just feel it like you're up against a brick wall. I mean, my first book, I probably spent four years writing it. Then I had one, the next one took a bit quicker, the one after that was a bit quicker again. You know, suddenly I had this sort of best-selling series. So as you're sort of intimating, just try to think in a in the longer term. The other sort of aspect to that book I wrote, Think Long, is that people are living longer lives now. We have longevity. So, you know, once upon a time, people might be worked out or dead by the time they were 50 or something. Now you might live to your 90s or 100. So you actually, you know, logically have more time than you think to change career or embark on very big life projects that, you know, 100, 200 years ago just sort of wouldn't have been possible for most people. Definitely. You know, it's a huge, it's a huge mindset shift and something I relate to a lot. The the other thing that I I relate to a lot is kind of this, I've heard you talk about, well, a couple of things. There's a lot of different directions I want to go with this because I, I relate to you on a lot of levels, both personally and kind of professionally. I've been working on my book for like five years and up until very recently, I've been beating myself up because it's like, my God, you need to finish this thing, but <laughs> taking taking the uh, the long view actually almost instantly helped me to produce, like helped me to get in touch with my ideas in a more real way and and produce something that I, I now know is is much better quality. Even though nothing else has changed, like I, I I now know internally that I have a better grasp on my ideas and what I want to say and who I'm saying it to. So that's been crucial. But you also said something that really mapped onto my journey, which was, and this is in another interview, I believe, but you said that 
you started with self-help and that's kind of where I started too, back when I was 18, actually, I'm, I'm 36 now, but over the period of time that you started writing books over kind of a 10, 15 year period, you said that the same person who was reading those self-help books is now reading, you know, psychology books and, and um, more rigorous things and even philosophy books. And that's kind of my trajectory is I, I started reading self-help and then I started realizing, okay, like these are interesting ideas. Like, what are they grounded in? Where, where, where's kind of the rock bottom? And then that led me to philosophy, frankly, because a lot of a lot of modern ideas of, of self-help and, and how to live in the world and how to conduct yourself are derived from older philosophical works. They're, they're just more modernized and updated, at least in, at least in my view. And then, and then of course, psychology is, is in there too. Psychology has old roots also, but it's been modernized. And so anyway, that was an interesting trajectory that you articulated that I also had. Yeah. I mean, it's just that people demand more now in terms of grounded research. Yeah. Uh, look, a book like, say, How to Win Friends and Influence People, Think and Grow Rich, they're still very powerful and, you know, you can gain a lot from them. But there is a point when you think, okay, they may be true, but what's sort of behind that? So how does my brain actually work, for instance? So then you start to think, well, Daniel, Daniel Kahneman's got this book, Thinking Fast and Slow, about the two sort of brains we have inside us and how they sometimes may be in conflict. And, hey, that might, that might explain why, oh, I want to be financially independent, but now I'm getting sabotaged or something like that. Or I want to be like this sort of extrovert and friend winner, mm -hmm. but actually maybe I'm not actually like that. So then you, then you look into the, into the psychology of personality and yep. Carl Jung and personality types, et cetera, and introversion, extroversion. So I think maybe what you're suggesting, I agree with that, is that at some point on the success journey, what becomes most important is the self-knowledge. And you can only really get that through, you know, philosophy or religion. And things like Stoicism, which is so popular now, is that I believe that, say, Stoicism is popular because it's like a system of ethics and a means to self-knowledge that is in no way sort of spiritual or religious. So it's 2,000 years old, but it's very logical, and it leads you to this path of self-knowledge. And if you know yourself, then you're not going to sabotage yourself and you can have a more solid foundation for trying to achieve what you want in life. Yeah. In something I listened to, you were giving life advice to a young man, I believe. And at some point you said something that was really, really impactful for me. And I wish I had transcribed it because it was so good. I'm going to have to go back and do it, but I'm going to, hopefully I can jog your memory here and you can, and you can um, <laughs> uh, rederive it. You started talking about, you have to go through this kind of wilderness period in life. And that I think Freud called the digging in the mud or something like that. And I, I really, you, you went on this whole kind of, you know, two minute little, little talk about it, but what I mapped it onto in my, my own life was that, yeah, I just kind of, at some point I started, I started my, my kind of online persona with posting self-help material. And then I realized that I had to create, once I realized, once I found philosophy and psychology, I had to recreate my knowledge structure kind of from scratch. And, and that's what I've been doing for the past few years, but it's been a very, very intense process. It's been a very, mm. very, I, like, I haven't exactly known what I'm, trying to say but i know that there's something that i'm that i'm trying to articulate that's that's unique and and that's original and that's useful but when you said digging digging in the mud and like going through this wilderness period i really related to that can you talk more about uh, what you were what you were saying there yeah um when i was researching that book think long i just you know studied a lot of famous people in history and i just noticed that so many of them had this period where they were either unknown or they had been, had some sort of early fame and then it sort of frisked away and, you know, they were sort of back to square one. But in, in both cases, it was a time of having to dig deep. Like Sigmund Freud, you know, before he wrote Interpretation of Dreams, he spent like 10 years just dealing with patients, reading a lot, trying to formulate ideas in his mind. And 
you know, the problem with history and biography is that we see everything in hindsight. We only see the finished product, you know, the famous book or whatever that they created. But in doing so, what's a lot more interesting and useful is to look at what people were doing before all that happened, Mm -hmm. before they were famous, successful. How were they spending these years? Like, you know, it might have been a 10-year period of just digging deep, as you said, going very deeply into some subject. Charles Darwin was a classic example. It wasn't 10 years. It was a lot more than that. It was like 20 years Mm. doing little experiments in his garden about, you know, natural selection and evolution and so on. And then finally, you know, in his 50s, he he comes out, you know, with the origin of species. So I'd say that to anyone, don't ever be um, afraid or ashamed or worried about the time you're spending in this sort of digging deep or wilderness period. If it's not getting you any sort of obvious acclaim or anything externally, but if if you're willing to do it, you'll come out the other end with something some sort of element of truth or an idea for some service or some, you know, massively increased ability to to help other people or or do something for them. You know, it's it's never going to be wasted, is my point. Yep, I I definitely relate to that. I I feel like I've been really holed up in my, not just physically in in my office, but also just in my mind for the past several years, just trying to figure out what I'm, what I'm saying, what I'm doing, what my message is. And just now, just very recently, I, I feel like I've been coming out more and, and, and ready to kind of articulate more things to, to the world. And so there's a point though, where you, you, you're not sure where you are. You just don't know. It's, everything's so dark. And it's like, like, I, I remember thinking many, many times, like, do I know anything at all? Like, have I, I I've read so many books, but do I have, do I have any knowledge whatsoever? And it was just this whole mesh of confusion, but then there is light at the end of the tunnel and, and there is, you know. Well, yeah, I'd say don't push it. I mean, like I, I sort of probably got to a similar phase having read all these hundreds of self-help motivational books. I thought, have I got original thought in my head? Am I just like this machine for processing them? Yeah. But only after several years, I started to think, oh, there's this missing element in the whole field, which is time that no one's really talking about or, or, or taking account of. So, you know, then, then I wrote the book. But, you know, that took several years and um, I, I probably did feel a bit disheartened or, you know, I wondered where it was going. But you just have to sort of trust in the process and um, that you'll come out of it w- with something useful. Yeah, yeah. Okay, well, I want to be respectful of your time here, Tom. So I want to start wrapping up, but I have like some random questions for you that just don't really fit into anywhere that I was curious about. So if you don't mind, I'll just kind of go through those here. Far right away. Mm-hmm. Okay, so I-, I think I noticed that in, I think it was in the self help, but yeah, okay. So you categorized the Bible in self-help rather than in spirituality. That was surprising for me. What, what, what led to that decision? Well, because even if you don't believe in God or Jesus, there's just a ton of life lessons, yeah. you know, in the Bible about how to treat other people, how to think about your place in the world, yeah. how to sort of believing in the miraculous, even when it looks like you're in a mess, tons of things like that that I just thought, you know, I'm, I agree it's a bit quirky, but I just thought even if you're a zero believer, yeah, you know, if you if you do read that book, you, you're you're going to come out of it, you know, with with some useful life lessons. Makes sense. Makes sense. Obviously, like I I think that that's true. I think that the Bible is probably the first official kind of self-help book or one of the first at least. Exactly. Yeah. You know, because what it is in, in essence is like us trying to figure out what we're doing, what we're doing, what we're up to and, and, and what we should go. And, and we're not exactly clear on it, you know, so it's, it's kind of an odd, it's an odd book in some sense, but we're doing our best to figure out we're piecing together all these different, you know, we're watching ourselves, you know, and trying to figure out what we should be up to and what we are up to. So I think it's a really useful, it, it's a useful categorization. It just kind of threw me off just because, you know, there, there's the, the Tao Te Ching and, and other spiritual texts are properly classified in the, in the, in the spiritual classic book. But um, I was curious on your insight there with the, with the Bible. So. 
Oh, yeah. No, I mean, by rights, I should have had every religious classic in the yeah. self-help one. But <laughs> right, right. I just saw I'd throw the Bible in. <laughs> yeah, yeah, fair enough. Okay, then I guess the other thing is, do, do you have a particular reading schedule? Like, is all you're doing all day reading? Is half your day devoted to reading and then half to writing? Or like, what's your schedule like? So when I'm writing a book, tend to be, this is probably very important if anyone out there who's trying to retain more, is that whenever you are reading a book, you're taking notes at exactly the same time in real time. So whenever I'm working, I have the book here, usually a physical book, not always, and I'm reading a page, I'm taking notes. If you wait till afterwards, after you finish the book and sort of jot down some random impressions, it's not really going to be enough. You're going to miss out on a lot of the nuggets, quotes, very subtle points that are, that are in a book. So when I'm working, I'm always reading and, and writing at the same time. And my other tips for working is like try and start as early in the day as possible, get as much done as you can before lunchtime, and try, try to turn off your phone and notifications. I resisted having a smartphone for years and years because I knew it would just take time off my deep work. Yeah, It's a lot harder to do that now. If you read interviews by like Jonathan Franz and a fiction writer and he will say his laptop has, has no internet connection and his phone's hidden in some other part of the house. So if you're doing any writing, that's sort of a number one rule really is um, the book Deep Work by Cal Newport talks a lot about that. Really, it's, it's super important. How many hours a day or a week or however you want to describe it would you say you read? Well, lately, I mean, I'm on a new project now where I'm trying to starting up a new online platform, which is like the key ideas and things in like 10 point format. So I'm not reading as much as I was before. When you were reading, I guess when you were doing the work for the for the classics, how much would you read per day? Look, I'd probably be four or five hours a day. Wow. And, you know, taking notes for for three hours as well and maybe some later in in the evening. The point is that it seems like a lot, but even if you only read an hour a day or, you know, listen to books or something on Audible, you know, over 10, 20 years, that's a lot of stuff that you're soaking up. So, it's again, it's just all about compounding. Just try to do a bit each day. And even after a couple of years, you'll you'll be way ahead of your peers in terms of, not just knowledge that you have or facts, but being open to a lot more ideas, which will serve you well in, in every part of your life, not just work, but, you know, relationships, uh, society, everything, understanding politics. Yep, absolutely. The other question I was going to ask is, do you make use of audiobooks at all? I'm not really an audio listener. I like reading. I like having a book in front of me. But, you know, other people are totally different. They never read. They only listen. For every person, one particular sense dominates over the others. Yeah. So it's just really um, whatever works for you. I mean, all my books are in audio and I get some people saying, I listen to them on the gym, on my commute. I've never read one page of your books. So (laughs) it doesn't really matter. You know, it's just content. uh, I'm not attached to books per se. There is something romantic about books, though. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. No, I love them. I mean, I love them as objects. You know, I've got a huge library and um, I like, for me, just seeing like the cover of a book, you know, in front of me reminds me of its key idea or it's a little motivator. Mm -hmm, Exactly. It's like a post-it note. Exactly. So if it's all hidden in, in my computer somewhere, I might never sort of think about it again. So if I see something, you know, it's like a little physical map of ideas that I'm reminded of. Yeah, totally. 
No, that's a good point. I've thought of that before. I've thought of, I've, I've been thinking about that. Like the reminders and you, you have the idea, the physical ideas floating around you at all times. If you have a library and if it's in your office. So that's a useful, useful way to look at it. Okay. Well, I, I, I don't know. kind of want to end with you talking about what you're working on now and where people can find you. You mentioned, you just alluded to it right now. Memoed is your, your new project. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so it's sort of a natural progression from all my years writing when I was trying to pull out the key ideas from books. It's just now, you know, people learn on their phone. You know, it's all sort of micro-learning now. Don't necessarily want to read a whole book. So we just had this idea that some place where people could share like 10 points, say, on, on some podcast they listen to or book they've read or idea they have in a 10-point format and share it. So that's what we're still in, in beta, but this platform, memo, M-O-M-E-M-O-D dot com. We've already got like hundreds of memos on there. So check it out if you want, you know, quick ideas in a few minutes, learn quickly. It's pretty good. M-E-M-O-D dot com, memoed. So it, it, can anybody post or is it this, these are posts from the company itself that can be consumed by consumers? About half of it is ones we've written ourselves. Like there's a lot of stuff on there that I've written myself. But now we're starting to have creators coming on board. Oh, okay. So yeah, anyone anyone can can sign up and start posting memos themselves. Oh, interesting. Yeah, so you could do it. And what people are saying to me is that I feel like I never really understand or grasp the topic now until I turn it into like a 10-point memo. So it's for their own retention. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. Got it. And, and, but, but it's also publicly available. Yeah, yeah. And anyone can read anyone's notes. Okay. So it's like, you know, you go into Khan Academy or all these learning platforms and there's tons of amazing stuff, but it's all in different sizes and shapes and formats and courses. On memo, it's, it's like... Twitter, you know, everything's 280 characters. Got it. On memo, everything's like 10 points. So it's sort of easy vessel to put stuff into. Got it. Very cool. So you can kind of peer over your your neighbor's shoulder and, and see their notes, what they're working on and what they've extracted from, from books. That's very cool. That's a novel idea. I definitely will put that in the show notes. And then where can people find you if they want to know more about you and, and, and your work? I mean, just Google me, Tom Butler Bodon, and all the, my website will come up, which has got quite a lot of free content. All the books will come up on Amazon. You can see them. And, you know, the, the series, 50 Classic Series, which we've been talking about a lot. If you just put 50 Classics into Google, all these books that we've been talking about will come up. And then I've got this other series, you know, which is like I write introductions to sort of famous classic books these capstone classics. Yeah. I've got that as well because, as you suggested before we went on air, I'm really committed to bringing out, you know, the classic books in history that people, you know, often they seem too complicated or too old to really access now because you're much more likely to read a book that's been written in the last decade and something like 100, 200 years ago. Right. So it's sort of my mission to, to surface those books and sort of, you know, make them new for, for new generations. You've done an excellent job of that. I appreciate your work. Is there a particular message or anything you want to leave the audience with? Just that, you know, no time spent on yourself is ever wasted. Warren Buffett has said it as well, like the most important asset you spend any money on, it's always going to be yourself whether it's personal development or knowledge or so whatever sort of assets or career thing you're trying to get going, spend time, money, resources, whatever on your own development, you know, which exactly what your Think Grow Prosper is about. So um, I really like that, what you're doing. And so I think we're aligned on that. Thank you. I appreciate that. Mm. Tom, it's been great. Thank you again for coming on. Thank you, Ruben. Yeah, it's been great. Thank you. Hey, thanks for listening. You can find the show notes for this episode and all other episodes on my website at thinkgrowprosper.com slash podcast. 
That's where I put all the links and resources mentioned in each episode. It's also where I put the outlines of topics covered, which is a really good way to refer back to episodes in the future. Lastly, if you enjoyed this episode, I'd love to hear about it. Feel free to leave a review on iTunes with your biggest takeaway. I make it a point to read all the reviews. You can also screenshot this episode and share it to your social media along with something you learned or found interesting. And tag me in your post because I'd love to see what you found interesting. Say hi and thank you for your support. 